Brachial plexus physical examination. I'm Dr. Peter Apel. My partner and I, Cesar Bravo, will be presenting the brachial plexus physical exam today. We thank our fellow Nicholas Foger for his help with this presentation. We have no disclosures. We'd like to acknowledge our mentors at the Mayo Clinic in Wake Forest. Uh, here is our brachial plexus team at Crowley Clinic. It's important to remember that care of the brachial plexus patient is a team approach. Plexus comes from the Latin word braid, which means a branching network. The brachial plexus starts at the roots uh, as they come out of the spinal cord and include contributions from C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1. As the roots uh, pass distally, they form the upper, middle, and lower trunks. As the uh, brachial plexus passes under the clavicle, the anterior and posterior divisions come together to form the lateral, posterior, and middle cord, named based on their relationship with the uh, axillary artery. Distally, uh, distal to the pectoralis minor muscle, the brachial plexus goes into the terminal peripheral nerves. The physical exam of the brachial plexus starts with sensation. Sensation follows the normal dermatomes and should be documented with all exams. Manual motor testing is the most complex aspect of the physical exam and will be covered in detail here. In addition, pulses should be checked at the radial, ulnar, and brachial levels, as oftentimes pan plexal injuries have associated vascular injuries. Exam for tenels at the roots and Horner syndrome is also helpful in differentiating pre versus post ganglionic brachial plexus injuries. Range of motion of the shoulder, elbow, wrist, and hand should also be performed both actively as well as passively. For the brachial plexus exam, we recommend using an exam template. This can be done through your electronic medical record or on paper. This allows the same examiners to perform a serial exam uh, in order to have consistency and reliability. Motor grading should be on the strict published grading scales, and all the muscle groups should be in, examined at the same visit in order to document progression with time. Range of motion should also be documented at each visit. Here's an example of the text from one of our templates. For the manual muscle testing, we input the muscle grade, uh, and as well, we also have the roots and peripheral nerves associated with the nerve to help us to localize the injury in cases where the pattern is unknown. It's important to remember that full range of motion in the arc of passive range of motion is necessary in order to have a grade three. Grade three is uh, motion against gravity throughout the range of motion. It's important to, to look for trick motions, especially with elbow flexion that can be due to the brachioradialis, the Steindler effect, or the reverse Steindler effect. In addition, be careful with gravity uh, overestimating the degree of motor power that the patient actually has, especially when examining the triceps. We'll start our exam at the root level. Injuries at the root level can be preganglionic, that is, the injury is intraspinal. For these injuries, the nerve rootlets pull out of the spinal cord. This is much like an electrical plug being pulled out of the socket. Because the dorsal root ganglion uh, remains alive, the actual peripheral nerve remains alive, and so there's no Wallerian degeneration. There's no tenels in the supracavicular fossa. There's universally involvement of the rhomboids and the serratus anterior, as well as the phrenic nerve. Horner syndrome is commonly present, especially if lower roots are involved. For nerve conduction studies, there's intact sensory conduction, as the nerves themselves will still conduct, but clinically patients have no sensation. Pseudomeningeal seals can be seen on CT, myelograms, or on MRI scans. Clinical presentation of a preganglionic energy is typified by supracavicular swelling and tenderness, winging of the scapula, and deafferent pain. That is an extremity that feels painful to the patient, but is clinically insensate. Preganglionic injuries often have Horner syndrome, as well as periscapular atrophy, and shifting away from the injured side, as well as an elevated hemidiaphragm. Horner syndrome is characterized by ptosis, meiosis, and anhydrosis, as seen in this patient's left eye. Note the drooping eyelid, the constricted pupil, and the lack of sweat 
on that side of the face. This comes from injury to the sympathetic chain at the lower root levels. Next, we'll look at the physical exam grouped by muscle group. The trapezius exam has three parts, shoulder shrug, resisted arm abduction, and ensuring that the scapula moves laterally with shoulder abduction. So we're examining the upper part of the trapezius. Sir, can you shrug your shoulders? And we've got some slight abduction to reduce, reduce the effect of the rhomboids. Now, do not let me press down. Okay. Now, we want you to abduct the arm, raise the arm, and, don't, and I'm going to push sideways. Don't let me do that and, and resist. Okay. That's, raise your arm. Abduction of the arm should move the scapula laterally. Injury to the C5 nerve root affects the cervical paraspinal muscles. The unaffected contralateral side will pull the neck away from the injured side. In addition, there's typically an injury to the dorsal scapular nerve. In 95% of patients, the dorsal scapular nerve branches off of the C5 nerve root. Injury at this level causes atrophy of the rhomboid muscles and the levator scapulae, which clinically leads to a depressed appearing scapula as seen in the clinical photographs here. To examine the rhomboids, ask the patient to pinch the scapula between the examiner's fingers and palpate the muscle firing. So I'll, if you can squeeze your wing blades into my fingers. Okay, here, okay. To examine for uh, nerve root injury involving C5, 6, and 7, examination of the long thoracic nerve is beneficial. To examine the long thoracic nerve, look for winging of the scapula. So go ahead and raise your arms to here. Now don't let me push back. Hold it tight. Okay, now relax. Now try to push your shoulder, your front part of your shoulder, to my hand, and don't let me push back. Relax. Postganglionic lesions are important to identify because they're potentially repairable either with nerve grafting or nerve transfers. Nerve injuries at this level are capable of regeneration as they are essentially peripheral nerve injuries. They overall carry a better prognosis. EMGs will demonstrate normal innervation of the cervical paraspinal muscles as the level of injury is distal to where the motor nerves take off to go to the paraspinals. Next, we'll go through the physical exam by muscle group, looking first at the upper, middle, and lower trunks. The upper trunk injuries are typified by shoulder adduction and medial rotation, elbow extension, forearm pronation, and wrist flexion. And these are due to injuries at the C5 and C6 levels to the suprascapular and axillary nerves. The deltoid has three main parts, the anterior, middle, and posterior deltoid. The middle and posterior deltoid can be examined separately. Anterior deltoid is difficult to isolate on exam. So we're gonna assess the middle deltoid. So hold it there, don't let me push down. Okay, now turn to your side and forward. Now I want you to kinda of like, a, you're gonna dive, don't let me push down, hold it tight. Okay, now to remove the tricep, Contribution, hold it there, don't let me push it down. Okay, now come this way, face this way. Now rotate the arm in and elevate it and hold it there. Okay, don't let me push it down. Okay. The supraspinatus and infraspinatus exam tests the contribution from C5, C6 to the suprascapular nerve. The supraspinatus exam is performed doing the empty can and full can test. Remember that these also test for impingement. The infraspinatus is tested by examining for resisted external rotation with the arm at the side. The subscapularis muscle is examined by performing the liftoff test, which checks for internal rotation lag, as well as the bear hug exam. So here we're gonna test your rotator cuff muscles. So we want you to put your arm here and in this plane of the scapula. Now put your thumb up and don't let me push down tight. Okay, and also twist, put your thumb down, make a fist, and don't let it push down, okay. Relax, now with the arm at the side, I'm gonna push in, don't let me do that, you push out, 
Okay. Now go ahead and put your arm across the front part and push down there, tight, tight, tight. Is that painful? No. So I'll lift here. So this is the, don't let me lift. This is the strength of the upper subscat. Now relax. And now we would want you to turn to the side, put your arm behind your back, and try to lift it off your back. One second. Hold it there. Hold it there. Now to test the strength, I'm going to push in. Don't let me push in. Okay. Good. And now if I were to lift it here, I'm going to drop it and you hold it there. No lag sign. Good. The biceps and brachialis is examined by testing for elbow flexion. Be wary of trick maneuvers when examining for elbow flexion, including the Steinler and reverse Steinler effect. Here, a patient demonstrates the reverse Steinler effect, where with maximal wrist extension, she can flex the elbow. However, when wrist extension is neutralized, she's unable to perform elbow flexion. Here, a routine biceps exam is performed in a normal patient. Feeling for bicep strength? Okay. Now, we're going to put you in a position, and then I want you to do the opposite maneuver of what I tell you. So we're going to test for supination, so we put the arm, the forearm in supination, and then don't let me twist it. You hold it there. That's testing for supination strength. Now we're going to test for pronation, so we put you in pronation, and now hold it there. Don't let me turn it. Good. Good strength there. Okay. Functional anatomy of the middle trunk is important as the status of C7 is critical to planning nerve transfers. When the brachial plexus injury extends to C7, there's typically involvement of the triceps with weak or absent triceps. The same is true for wrist extension where motor power is absent or weak. Wrist flexion is typically weakened with a C7 injury, although preservation through C8 roots is common. The anatomy of this is secondary to C7 contributing a large number of motor fibers to the triceps, such that when C5, C6, and C7 are all injured, triceps function is typically absent. So here, what I want you to do, hold it there. We're gonna take gravity away, and I'm gonna try to push against me. That's testing the tricep strength. And this is a way to take away gravity. C7 does contribute both to wrist extension and wrist flexion. Wrist extension is largely due to C5 and C6. However, C7 contributes to the ECU. When C5 and C6 are injured, typically the patient will have ulnar deviation with wrist extension. If the injury extends to C7, the contributions are eliminated and wrist extension is usually markedly weak or absent. If the injury extends to C7, the FCR will be affected, thus markedly reducing power and wrist flexion. Contributions from C8 to the FCU, though, typically allow for some wrist flexion on physical exam. The pectoralis muscles are innervated from contributions from C5 to T1 via the medial and lateral pectoral nerves. C5 and C6 contribute to the clavicular head of the pectoralis major, while C7, C8, and T1 contribute to the sternocostal head. Patients are examined by pressing the palms together and palpating the two heads. The pectoralis minor is innervated by contributions from C8 to T1 via the medial pectoral nerve, and it's much more difficult to isolate on physical exam. Can you press your hands together and elbows up? Okay, hold it tight. Don't let me push away. Here, testing the sternocostal portion and testing the clavicular portion. Relax. The latissimus dorsi has contributions from C6, C7, and C8, and is responsible for adduction, extension, and internal rotation. Exam can be performed with coughing to differentiate the latissimus from the teres major. So for testing for latissimus, you kind of adduct here the arm and extend, and you're going to push back and don't let me do, not let me push, push against me. There you go. Okay. Now relax. Now I want you to cough. <coughs> cough hard. <coughs> okay. Lastly, the anatomy of the lower trunk is examined. 
C8, examination is performed by um, examining the finger flexors, and T1 by examining the intrinsics of the hand. Okay, so bend the tip of your finger, only pull back, bend your fingers together, then only push back, pull back, okay, relax. Bend the tips of this small finger, no, hold it tight, hold it tight, okay. Now bend this one, only bend that, okay, good. Now push this way, push out, and only push in for the APB. Okay, now this one push out. Okay, now go ahead and put your fingers together. This way, spread them apart, together. Now open it. Okay. And then push out, and we push in. Good. A careful and detailed physical examination will allow you to care for the brachial plexus patient by localizing their lesion, following their progress, and planning your intervention.